anything, any comment from the public on on anything other than this project? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Can I just ask that everyone who's speaking speak directly into the microphone? Um, I may need to play with the volume buttons a little bit, but that way it picks up and it can be for people who are. You'll probably need to get closer to it than that. Options. All right, so let's begin. I'm David Kubik with BKSK Architects. And Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I don't hear that well, and with masks, it's really much harder. I'm happy and to take that off. Stand at the podium so that the microphone could be like four inches away from you, then that would be um, much better. Or if you could hold it while you're speaking. I can hold it, and if everyone's comfortable, I can see. Uh, okay. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, uh, David Kubik with BKSK Architects and Jeff Squire with Berkshire Group. Um, Jeff has presented in the last hearing many of his site planning and landscape uh, documents. Much of that was kind of understood and many of the comments last hearing were uh, focused on the architecture. Um, so we have those documents if anyone needs to refer to them, but I think we would prefer to just jump right into the architectural portion of the presentation and address the comments that we heard. So um, here's the plan to start with um, a simple agenda. So first off, thanks for a very productive and constructive first hearing. Um, we listened carefully to everyone's comments and we really considered um, all of the um, topics at hand and really tried to synthesize what everybody said and come back to you with a revised proposal that we think uh, really meets the spirit of the design guidelines and addresses directly uh, many of the comments. So um, just quickly reading through this agenda, um, so these are some of the topics that we heard that we've addressed. Exploring warmer tones on the ground floor, pedestrian areas, and facade material. Considering an alternate window with the metal panel removed or changed. Um, provide a perspective of the residential entry area. Provide information for the wood cladding and other material samples in general. Provide a detail of the main elevation with some more dimensions for reference. Uh, setback, we, we heard that the setback from the street was acceptable. However, street trees may be requested in the zoning board meeting. Um, and to just start with that, one additional tree was um, requested in that zoning board meeting, which we can show you. Um, explore an alternate language for the fifth floor metal piers on the main facade. Explore an alternate cornice design with more depth and projection, um, with perhaps more emphasis on the fourth floor cornice. Provide pr a perspective of the fifth floor area, showing the cornice and alternate to the white metal. Um, and include a detail for the setback railing for that terrace on the fifth floor. Include information regarding uh, the parapet height and how it might be able to conceal mechanical equipment. Uh, provide some additional dimensions for the ground floor canopies that are at the retail entry and the residential entry. And explore um, larger openings and a ceiling treatment in the underpass um, car entry area to hopefully allow for more natural lighting and just better lighting in general for that area. Um, and before we go into the slides, even just starting with the first point about warmer tones, I think you'll see this across all of the images, um, that that is something we tried um, carefully to incorporate into the revised design. Um, and many of the materials and the material locations were revised to just in general provide a more warm palette um, for the building, 
kind of steering away from some of the silver and gray tones and, and introducing more um, kind of uh, warm and brown tones to the, to the design. So we'll show you that. Uh, regarding the plans, nothing has really changed with the floor plans, but we can walk through these um, briefly. And there is actually one site plan change that would be helpful to explain here on the ground floor. Um, so again, the basics of the ground floor remain the same, which is a retail facing King Street, a residential lobby with a, um, a residential entry walkway along the facade mm -hmm. into that lobby, and then the, the parking area behind. One of the first things we did um, was relook at the site plan and try to see if there was any way that we could um, shorten the expression of the building on King Street. And we were able to introduce a retaining wall here that was able to lower the parking area by one foot nine. By doing that, we were able to take the entire building down with it. So our new proposal that we're showing today, every dimension is one foot nine lower than it was last time, mm -hmm. which we're happy to report back that we were able to solve that jigsaw puzzle. And I think it really helps with the expression on the street to kind of you know, bring it down and, and get it as low as it can be. That's probably the biggest change in this plan, and that was really done by introducing a retaining wall right here um, with this uh, exit where the cars um, come back out. This is um, the rendered site plan that Jeff's office has provided, which I think is also just a helpful orientation tool to understand how the project sits on the site. Again, now we're showing uh, two trees. This one here in the middle is an additional tree from the last scheme. Um, and we've located it at a kind of natural break point between um, the two entrances for the retail. Perhaps this retail is, is one tenant, it could be two. And if it's two, this kind of sets up a natural break point between those two spaces for the retail area. And then I also think it's helpful to see the way that Jeff has drawn the, the rear of the building where we have um, a connection to the bike path, a bike shelter, a little seating area, and really kind of a kind of private, intimate little garden space in the back of the building. And these trees are existing, and they are being retained. They're being saved. Um, so it's a nice kind of screening along the bike path um, and a nice garden space for the residents. It's just a mezzanine level for the for the parking system. <coughs> it's not a, a true floor for the building. This is the typical floor building that, or typical floor plan for the building, which has not changed. This happens um, from second to fourth floor in the building. Um, as you might recall, on the fifth floor, the apartments on the, the rear of the building are the same as the floors below, but there's a um, an amenity space, a kind of club bar amenity space for the residents of this building. Um, on the fifth floor facing King Street, um, which we'll get into on the facade, but that's, that's partly why you see a slightly different expression on the fifth floor of the, of the main facade. And there's a terrace here that faces south. This is the um, main roof plan, just showing that um, there is access to the roof for the residents in the building um, with the elevator core and fire stairs coming up, um, a green roof, uh, a more kind of public occupied roof um, coming up from the stair in a lobby and a mechanical and a um, solar panel area in the rear of the building. This is a slide that we did not include in the last presentation, but thought it was helpful to see, which is just a reminder that we've set ourselves a very high bar for the performance of this building and we will be pursuing um, a passive house standard, which is basically a performance standard applied to buildings that makes them extremely environmentally conscious and good performing buildings. Um, and one of the ways in which you can do that is also to build with a mass timber um, structure for the building itself. So this is a representative image of what an apartment interior can feel like when you use the mass timber construction technique, where you expose the structural slabs instead of it being know, concrete or steel or deck, you have um, this really nice warm wood exposed ceiling and you see the um, main primary frame in uh, mass timber construction as well. This was the slide we included last time, which again just um, 
for us is a really great reminder about some of the most important characteristics of, of the buildings in the downtown area and, and what's important about them. Again, some of the common characteristics being that many of these buildings have a common window size. It's the same window. It's not different size windows or different configurations, but often the same window in just different groupings, whether you know it's a bay of two or a bay of five or a bay of three, but there's, a, there's an effort to kind of regularize and keep the same um, window size across the facade. Um, masonry piers obviously play a really big role in the articulation of these facades and rightly show up in the design guidelines for the town. Um, and lastly, I think there's a great appreciation for these highly detailed cornices that you see on many of the buildings. And that's something we also took to heart and tried to incorporate um, in our proposal, which we'll show you. Yes, with each slide, I'm going to show you what we presented to you last time and then show you the new one for each view. This is what we presented last time. Um, as you can recall, much of the palette was more a silver gray, almost kind of like a gunmetal gray color. We had white piers with a slightly more contemporary expression at the fifth floor, and the brick language, for the most part, extended all the way down and was used for the, for the storefront. And the cornice here at the fourth floor was a very kind of thin plate expression, and there was a conversation that I thought was um, very helpful about, you know, where should that emphasis be? Where does it make sense to kind of draw a strong line for this building? <laughs> this is the revised elevation for the building. And some of the big changes are, first, the tones. Instead of the silver, um, kind of uh, you know, light gray color, we've introduced a sort of dark brownish gray color for, for many of the elements, both the window frames themselves, some of the metal panels and storefront mullions, and as well, and perhaps most importantly, a much stronger projecting cornice um, at the fourth floor of, of the building. And we think that that helps have the primary reading really be a four-story building first, which will help um, with its height in, you know, on the pedestrian experience on King Street. And then um, instead of a metal panel below the building, we've introduced a brick panel instead. And we're going to show you these samples. Um, so basically, there's a, a field brick color and then there's a little bit of a, an alternate brick color which has iron spotting on it. So this would be the field brick, the majority of the brick. This would be located, this iron spotting brick um, would be located under the windows and at the fifth floor. You can see it's a slightly darker tone. Um, and it just gives the brick a little bit of change of character um, as almost like a decorative element. Um, and then the other big change would be on the storefront where again we've introduced that um, warm brown color, as well as pulling the wood uh, material that was along the residential entry out to the front of the facade and, and bringing it across that retail storefront area. We also think that worked well because it started to really set up the building in a more kind of traditional notion of base, middle, and top. Um, and it, it, it distinguishes the storefront um, a little bit differently than the body of the building. And you don't get the brick language um, as much on the ground floor, and it kind of distinguishes the storefronts a bit. And then the cornice line up at the fifth floor was minimized a little bit, and but we also introduced a projection on that top coping, just again to give a little bit of a cash out of which you'll see better in the rendering. Um, the fifth floor columns, as well as those um, decorative tiles at the cornice, are kind of a, a sort of soft muted gray. Again, just to kind of quiet down the top floor, and it's a much simpler expression. It's just basically almost like an industrial column. It just has two flanges and a, and a flat plate in between, um, almost to kind of bring back like an industrial language. This is just taking one bay. This was one of the, the comments. Um, that we were listing earlier in the agenda. This takes one day of the front facade and just blowing it up to a larger scale just to show you some of the dimensions of the key elements. Um, like the windows, three foot four by five foot four is, is that operable window. Um, we've also introduced um, an extra kind of transom line to the window wall at the fifth floor, which again kind of breaks down the scale of those glass panes so they don't get too big. And the height of that 
um, main window panel is now the exact same height as the window um, below it, just to kind of keep the scale of that. Um, we've added some more dimensions to these marquees, just um, for reference. The, the marquees that project at these residential entries are 10 inches tall, and they line up uh, next to the kind of decorative bell course of stone that happens in the ground floor facade. Um, you can also see on the right pictures of the material samples that are here on the board. Um, and again, this bigger part being the field brick, the majority of the wall, the iron spot brick always, always being under the window and on these bit floors here. And then this darker accent brick is used um, just for this little kind of zipper of brick that lines up with the division of the windows. Again, just as another decorative element to kind of break down the scale, introduce a little bit of color variation, tone variation um, to that main facade facing the street. This is uh, both the north and south elevation of the previous proposal. Here too, I think you can see the difference of kind of the silvery light grays um, uh, this language that had a kind of series of, of ribs and white columns. Here too is an important place to, to note that we had two openings on the entry drive-in area. And if we switch now to the new, new proposal, you can see the effect of introducing those um, darker, warmer tones, the window framing and the cornice. And then we've um, kind of regularized these openings on that drive-in area. Um, yeah setting it up symmetrically on that, the width of that um, portion of the facade, and basically added two more, so there's kind of twice as much openness to that, which we think will help with visibility, bringing in natural light, um, and keeping that well lit. This is the, the rear facade of the building facing the bike path, and really what we wanted to do here recognizing that it does have a presence a little bit to the bike path, even if it's green with the landscaping, to try to make it as pedestrian friendly as possible and kind of inviting and warm. And so the, the one change we made was to just, um, previously there was only some wood um, decorative panels on the ground floor, but other than that, the ground floor was completely solid. So we've um, added a little bit more glass to the ground floor, just to have a little bit sense of um, uh, light to that, so it's not, um, as closed, as solid on the ground floor right next to it. And again, this is just an enlarged portion of um, the rendered site plan showing that really this facade is both landscaped right, right along the base of the wall, as well as the existing trees and the garden space around it. Um, so this won't really be a facade that is experienced kind of like a street facade. You never get very far away from it. Um, it's sort of nestled into this garden space. It's a little bit different. to the renderings. So here again was the previous proposal, um, again with the, the kind of white and silver palette, the same cornice, which is helpful to see. It doesn't go down. It goes one foot nine down. Um, um, <laughs> really good. Um, and then uh, you can see the effect of that, that um, stronger, darker cornice. It also introduces stronger horizontal line, which I think the building was missing a little bit. It felt almost at times maybe a touch too vertical. And I think with those tone changes and that more bold cornice at the fourth floor, it feels like it relates to the street a little bit better. Uh, we've added a few windows along, along the side elevation that line up with the windows below. Again, you can see the, the kind of simplified profile of those piers at the fifth floor, the additional tree the retail previously proposed the upper bands where the decorative metal tiles were that we described last time that used to be oops that used to be kind of flush at the top and, and tilted a little bit we kind of regularized that as well where it's, it's um, just completely vertical now and there's a, there's a larger projection, so you can really see the effect of that cast shadow. If you just kind of compare before, there was very little shadow, almost none, and, and now there's an extra shadow line there, which I also think um, helps the reading of the building. Previously proposed. And the 
new. And, and this view perhaps kind of shows it best. Just the effect of introducing that warm wood on the storefront, I think, really helps to kind of lighten up the base, just make it a bit of a kind of special pedestrian experience separate from the building above, and, and really articulates the base in a better way than I think brick only did before. Uh, there were two views that were specifically requested last time, which was um, just a detailed view of the um, residential entry specifically. So you can see on the floor plan on the right, basically there's um, a dedicated walkway that kind of slips um, between the main facade and this kind of secondary facade that leads you to the double doors taking you into that residential entry. And one of the, the uh, metal ceilings, the canopies that kind of projects out over that area. And this is a nice moment because you get to see how the wood, um, and that's the sample here on the table, how the wood introduces a really kind of you know, nice texture, warm material right where that pedestrian, or sorry, the residential entry is. And then you can see the effect of that wood kind of turning and, be, and being brought out to the storefront in front. Um, there's good opportunity for some planting in this zone to kind of articulate it a little bit. And then right next to it is also the bike path that leads to the rear of the um, And so as that comes and meets this, you know, we could look at what we're showing here is kind of a, a slightly smaller scoring pattern on the concrete towards the residential, residential entry and a slightly different scoring pattern, pattern on the concrete here, maybe some inlay stone cobbles and to really kind of articulate those two zones as they come and meet together at the street. This is a view up at that uh, fourth floor cornice. This was also a view that I think people were interested in seeing just to explain it a little bit better. So again, this is a, a painted metal um, cornice at the top of the body of the building which has a good healthy projection, which you can see here. It's really a, a one foot three um, throw to that cornice. Um, and there's kind of you know little brackets at the structural at the structural moments, 20 feet on center. Um, and then that window wall for the amenity space on the fifth floor, those decorative metal tiles kind of harkening back to the highly detailed cornices of downtown. Here's that simplified language for the metal pier. And this was also a good opportunity just to explain a little bit better um, the railing at that setback terrace that came up um, in the last hearing. So the strategy would be to install that railing here, which is, needs to be three foot six above the finished paver height of that terrace. You install that railing behind the cornice element, behind the parapet. And what that allows us to do is kind of, you know, from a constructability point of view, get it in there in a nice clean way. and have it serve as a guardrail for the occupants on that terrace. But even more importantly than that, or as important as that, is because it's behind the cornice, you don't see it from, from any of these views. Um, sometimes you might just see, and you don't even see it here, like barely you start to see a line. So by setting it back like that, again, if you get way back in the parking lot, you might start to see a little bit of that line, but it's not a dominant reading to the facade. It's sort of set back. And, Um, this is a, a little detail of both um, the window arrangement for the back of the building. Um, we like to kind of refer to the front as the head building, and then uh, kind of after that break is sort of the uh, back part of the building. So the window on the left shows the strategy for installing the window when, when we're in the back portion of the building, which is to um, use a metal panel jam and head detail um, and to set this brick um, coplanar with the brick that's next to it, but still use the iron spot brick. And then in the front of the building, um, it's a little it's a little bit upgraded, where the brick actually returns to the window, and the brick below the window is set back two inches to give it a little bit more articulation for the masonry piers. And these are just a plan detail, and a section detail. We did look at that installation um, carefully to make sure what we were representing in the renderings was true and accurate. I didn't hear you. Which one goes where? So this is in the back of the building, oh, okay. just because it's a little bit simpler, using the metal panel. The whole, the whole the tail. Whole yeah, the whole tail, right. And then that head building um, would use this technique. Um, so again, just head building, tail. <laughs> um, and then this view I thought was helpful. It's just a general orientation, but um, it's, it's helpful to see here, and you can see it most clearly here, that for this back portion of the building, there would be a four-foot-high parapet um, all the way around the perimeter of it, which would really help 
as a strategy for concealing mechanical equipment. I think that was something that came up in previous conversations, and, and my, I think it's even specifically in the design guidelines. So we've set it up so that the parapet back there um, can be a four-foot high parapet and, and hide a lot of that mechanical equipment. Um, that's the last slide. Let me just make sure we get everything that was on our list. Oh, one other small thing. So we also just wanted to show this and that trying to introduce a, a white ceiling to this parking area with lighting in addition to those larger openings to really make sure that that's as well lit uh, as possible. Thank you. Uh, so I'll open it up to the board for comments and then we'll open it up to the public for comments. So that's a, a really unique brick that I've never seen before. Is that just the sample or is that the brick, you're, the actual brick you're going to use? Which one? The whole, the, the, uh, the thickness of them. So, oh, the thickness of them. Mm -hmm. um, this is one system. This is one system that's definitely in the running. There are many systems available that do this in very similar ways. Um, and we would work with them to basically select something that's similar. But the idea of iron spotting um, is not unique to them. That's, mm -hmm. This is a technique that happens for all brick manufacturers. Um, so we would basically kind of use these as control samples, kind of as we're talking to people, say, hey guys, this is what we presented, this is what we presented, mm -hmm. um, this is what we, what we need to stick to. Yeah, because I was looking at the returns on the windows for the front of the building. So I just don't know how that, would you use like a full-size brick or something? or? Oh, they make corner units for oh, all of them. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the benefits of this um, system is that they do that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to comment on the further brick there. That one, yes. Yeah. That's supposed to be the inset there. This, yeah. I think your rendering is very deceptive because I think that's going to show up very bright and red. I, yeah. What you're showing on your I, I don't disagree with you. This, this oh. does start to look Sorry. a little a little too red. Um, it's really the iron spotting that I kind of want to show on this sample. Um, so we would have to work with them to make sure that it's truly the darker version of the field brick. So I 100% agree with you, and you know we can share final samples and stuff like that. Yeah, I would like to see that. It really because you understand the darker yes. inset yes. tends to set back. And I think if it's that bright red color, it's going to pop too right. much at you. Yes. Yeah. This, I, I agree. The, the the fact that this red is just ever so slightly brighter than that is distracting. I'd say uh, more than ever so slightly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Considerably brighter. Sure. Don't disagree. It's really the iron spotting that I wanted to show. So you okay, can you yeah. can get this technique, which you know, if it's kind of more uniform on the brick, it darkens it. So um, we would definitely share those samples and and make sure that this effect is truly achieved. It would be really important. What, what type of mortar are you planning on using? Um, I, I was thinking that you would do a kind of traditional kind of buff color, but with a little bit of red tint to get it closer to the brick, which I think is kind of a classic New England way of handling it. I strongly agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know that came up in the last conversation. Some of this is just the limitations of what I can get a rendering yeah. to do. Um, but even since we've seen you, I, I been through some other New England towns like in Litchfield, Connecticut, and I've taken pictures of brick walls. But yeah, you just want that ever so slight red tint. Very common to have a, yeah. almost a match more or exactly. closer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, a gray mortar is totally out. No, I agree. Yeah. No, it's got to have that that kind of red tint to it so it gets close. Yep. On the on the upper cornice, uh, the upper building there, what are the lower the panels below the points? What? Uh, there are still metal panels. So oh, that's, yeah. that's these. Um, so so the, the inspiration for that, again, was those highly um, detailed brick cornices in, existing here on Main Street. So these tiles are the, the exact same size of a brick, two and a quarter by eight inches tall. And they just have this kind of dimple to them, a little depression to them. Um, and so they would, they would get um, panelized like this um, and then installed as just kind of a textured wall, a textured cornice. But it's a metal. It's a metal. It's product. metal. You yeah. painted metal, probably, likely aluminum. Yeah. And all, all of this being the same kind of tone. 
you hold up the wood sample? Sure. Uh, I'm curious uh, of how they deal with preservation of that material. Sure, yeah. So it was something I mentioned last time. I have better information to explain it this time. So uh, this is a pine wood that is treated. Um, it's called acetylated. It's a process. Um, and what that does is basically shrinks the air pockets within the wood and it makes it non-porous and extremely dimensionally stable. Because of that process, they, they offer a 50-year warranty on it. Um, and this is a wire brush finish and just a stain, and that's it. Um, you can let it weather a little bit or you can come back and stain it. Um, and you're welcome to, it's Delta Millworks, it's the company. Sorry, the tag is from the brick people. Um, we've used this product before. This will not be our first time using the product. We've used this product for the state of New York at a visitor center at Minnewaska State Park. Um, its construction is done, the building's up. They actually probably earned a lot of their um, interest and, and kind of fame as a material for doing like uh, ski lodges in Utah. It's, it's seen real weather. It's, Which is why we were comfortable. Yeah, it's not yeah. stained also? Yes, yep, okay. yep. may not be relevant to our purview of this, but I just was curious about your comment about the mass timber. Mm -hmm. Is that structural? Yes, that would be the primary structure of the building. So this is like, like so you would do a beam, but it's really kind of, a wood yeah. beam building? No, yeah, it, yes. <laughs> it's not um, sick built. You know, we're not doing like yeah, load-bearing yeah. stud walls. So you'd have primary columns, CLT, um, cross-laminated timber decks, um, and you're essentially building Yes, a post and beam structure with wood decks. The ground still, floor would still columns. No, wood columns. Really? Yes. So, so yes. Um, the only thing that. If I can. Yes. So uh, the, the columns and the beams are glue laminated. Can you get him to sure. start? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Jeff so Spiritos with the development team. So the columns and the beams are glue laminated timber. You may know that glue laminated timber has been used in buildings for 60 years. The big innovation is, is the cross laminated timber floor panels, which are made by layering wood in 90 degree dimensions with environmental friendly glue, precisely fabricated with the strength of concrete for a much faster, quieter, healthier, natural uh, installation. And you leave, you leave the, the underside of the ceiling exposed, which is what you can't do with any other structural system. The thickness varies depending upon spans. In our case, we have a 20 foot span. We'll probably have a six and seven eighths inch thick five ply panel. Six inch? Six and seven eighths, just under seven. Wow. Hopefully that helps. Just pulling up this image again. So this is really the effect that you get with that system. And then it's the first floor that would be a kind of concrete podium like you often see in developments of this size. Yes. I believe the architecture building at UMass is the first uh, mass timber structure in New England. Yeah, I, I know about that, right? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just hadn't realized that this building was being constructed right until oh, this sorry. meeting. I yeah. thought it was just a standard no. concrete yeah. seal. Sorry, we probably went by that a little too quickly in the first year. Right. <laughs> yeah, we mentioned that before. The, this project will target the passive house certification, which is just a energy performance, air tightness, thermal envelope um, you know, measuring system for, for the project, which again is very high bar to set for any building at this point. Can I ask a question with that in mind? You, you don't have um, too many solar panels for such a large building. How does that play into that? We uh, don't disagree with you. This is very much a kind of graphic placeholder and we have to engineer that, um, kind of do a design build engineering effort with an appropriate level KW performance out of that. So I think it probably won't end up so 
um, perfectly divided like this. Perhaps we kind of blend it together a little bit more, introduce more panels. Um, but I think, yeah, in order for it to be viable, it may need to be uh, a bigger footprint on the building. I haven't fully engineered that to be honest. And would you have condenser units up on the top of the roof as well? Um, likely a VRS system. And um, yes, you'd have the, the condensers on the roof. The risers coming down. But not for each unit. You wouldn't, you'd have, if, it was, if it's VRF, it would be for multiple units? There are different ways to engineer that. Um, sometimes you get one condenser per unit, and then other times you gang them together. You have to look at it. We want to do the individual condensers. They'd be combined to be able to serve up to, they'd be combined to be able to serve up to 12 or 15 units, and we'll be up there with the required ERV system, energy recovery ventilation system. That's the typical passive house solution for a central system. It's, it's pretty low. All of that equipment is pretty low, so that we really won't see it from off site. I'd, I'd like to talk about the windows for a bit, because <coughs> um, in <coughs> excuse me, the as I, in my mind, the two things that were most important that needed to be changed about this design was one, the cornice on the top of the building, and two, the way the windows look. Now, this your when you show the interior illustration, and also when you show the illustration looking at the building from the north side on King Street, looking down King Street, one of the windows looks the, the windows look much wider relative to their height in this illustration than they do when you look at it straight on. And when the when you look at the interior, um, you, one of the windows is is much wider than it's like twice as wide as the other one. The interior view is not our project. That was just a representative image. So, so that's, that's just to talk about mass okay. timber. But that, that's so that's not our job. <coughs> All right. um, but in terms of the window width, um, this is one three-dimensional model. There's, there's no changing of the window sizes. Um, so it's, so an, I, it's an optical illusion of some kind. Yeah, depending on which angle you're looking at, you know, the windows are set back, they have depth, um, but they are all represented correctly in the perspective with these dimensions. <laughs> this, this is probably the best accurate drawing to understand the, the pro proportions of the unit itself. Me, um, Not enough of a change I'm, for my, you know, this whole thing is about aesthetics and what we feel fits in with Northampton. And this, um, when I look at this building, you know, the cornice definitely helps on top, but when I look at this building, I think of those um, very large apartment buildings in downtown Amherst that I feel are very kind of industrial looking and, and don't really give you the um, feeling of the New England small town that the rest of Northampton has. And um, it might be as something as simple as moving three windows together um, so that you have groups of three windows um, going up and down. It might be something as simple as having a, a treatment where there was a sill going along the bottom, a stone sill that comes out going along the bottom of the three windows and then something on the top to, um, uh, be, it just, um, it doesn't do it for me. That, I, I don't know how, how else to um, express it. It's, and the, the, the windows on these buildings give a completely different feel than the windows on, that you're proposing on this um, building. So when we considered looking at the different options for the windows, we thought there were sort of um, two, two ways in which we were studying how to kind of improve their reading. Um, one of the comments we heard was the metal panel below was making the reading feel maybe more vertical than it really was, and switching it to brick would help make the proportion of the window read more kind of correctly. So that was one of the reasons why we changed the brick below. That was one change. And then the other most important change really is the, the color, changing it to that darker brown relating to the warmer brick. And then in terms of the window, window pattern itself, 
um, looking again at these precedents in, in Northampton, there are, there are definitely different window configurations. Some have lots of divisions, some have very few. Um, so are there options? Of course. Um, but we were reminded, and this, this slide even shows it, that there are countless examples of buildings that have a basic one over one division of the window, um, like this building, like this building, <laughs> like this building, like this building. So are there choices? There will always be choices, but I think it always comes back to a question of appropriateness. Are you doing something that's appropriate for the district and has a clear kind of reference for what you're doing? And given those examples, we felt that we were. Um, and I think going back to um, in terms of like a sill or a lintel expression, for us, we were really trying to do that through um, through the use of the uh, the vertical soldier bricks that they're almost introducing, kind of a horizontal beam and header condition that kind of frame the windows. And again, you, that's something that I recognize walking around town as well. That you know, brick patterns were also used in kind of playful matter, playful manners to kind of create different patterns and different readings, whether it's a vertical pier or a horizontal sill or a horizontal beam. Um, so that was one of the ways to introduce kind of the framing of the window itself was was the way in which we created the brick openings. Uh, I think I think part of what Joe was seeing in our traditional buildings, if you look at those elevations of downtown, there are several buildings like this three window grouping, the building in the upper left hand corner, you know, it's a three and then there's maybe that's a four or five in the middle. But those units are tighter together. You, you are principally using uh, a pattern of two and one, two and one, and they're staggered. And the, where the, you have the two pairs, the separation is very wide, so visually it doesn't read as grouping. It, when I look at the, the side of your building, it still kind of reads as a more like mono, mono you know, like similar. You know, I know this is all personal, but you know, they don't read as pairs or and there's no triplets at all there. So No, I, I agree. Is that what you're getting at, Chuck? Yeah. And actually if if you remember there was a suggestion that was brought up last at the last hearing that um, I actually took the trouble to bring it along with me on my um, on my pad. I and if you um, It did. It did have a. It showed groupings of three that um, I, I thought was more attractive, and that doesn't mean that. That's what you're looking for. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. The, you know, there, this was it had groupings of three and two. Right. Um, uh, but that is what I was. Um, Sure, and I, and I can I can address that a little bit more. So, um, again, on on our facade, what we were trying to do was set up a repetitive 20-foot bay. This actually relates to the to the mass timber structural column lines, and within that 20-foot bay, um, we are repetitive. And even and I know that you're saying this is two and one. Even in the two, the brick pier in between is is a 16-inch pier, which is a really common dimension um, from a masonry point of view when you're grouping windows. Um, so, sure, this isn't exactly the same, but I also think downtown is not exactly the same. There's so many varied oh, patterns. There's, there's so huge perhaps body, this is just a I, slightly new this, pattern um, that relates, this, relates it, well to, it to it the looks, idea that all, there are so many patterns. It looks more like a, a industrial warehouse building than a downtown commercial building to me. And I, and I know this is very, you know, we're talking about aesthetics, but that's, um, I, this is um, this is a huge project, and it has a it's going to be it, it's going to be very important for the future of downtown because it's going it, to it, it can influence what other people do, 
and it can really you know, point in the direction of, of changing the appearance of downtown. And you know, our whole mission is um, to protect the appearance of downtown because we feel, and, and when this committee was set up, it was set up because we feel that the architecture of downtown Northampton um, gives something that's really special and different than a lot of other places. And that's what, it's one of the most important things that gives us a commercial advantage over the malls and over shopping on the internet. People come downtown, they look around, they see cool looking, interesting buildings, and they say, we like being here, so we want to be here and we want to come here and spend money. Sure. And this building, um, the, the facade that faces King Street, just in my mind, doesn't um, doesn't go in the direction that I want to see that I would want to see, and I don't. You know, you could present something that was completely not like anything else in Northampton. I mean, the the Silverscape Building on the corner of of Main and King Street is like it has nothing in common with any other piece of downtown architecture, but it's a really cool looking, interesting building, and. Um, uh, I, um, and to me, what I want to see in this project, and and I like, I really like what you're doing here. I mean, I, this is a, this is a really great project, but the the facade just doesn't rise to the level of of something that's going to really make people look at it and say, this is really cool, this is really interesting. It's going to do what those. Um, those new buildings in downtown Amherst do. It's going to kind of dominate and um, dominate the landscape, but not be pleasing enough to the eye. So, just two comments on that. One, a kind of more programmatic thing that influences a lot of what you see on the facade, which is we have an interesting premise with this building, and I think it's an interesting challenge for any building that comes to you um, with these design guidelines, which is. Um, Many of the historic buildings downtown were really built as commercial buildings, not, not so much residential buildings. They're starting to be used as residential now, but really they were built as commercial buildings, which kind of allowed for that more regular kind of uh, monotonous window rhythms or, or grouping. Um, but really what we're doing here is we're taking a, a commercial building language, which is what the design guidelines are really talking about, taking a commercial building language and occupying it with a residential use. And those two things can sometimes work at odds. And, and I bring that up because a lot of that rhythm that you were seeing on the front is set up by big bay, little bay, big bay, little bay of what a residential unit requires, a living room, a bedroom, a living room, a bedroom. So in doing that layout, and we tested it many different ways, we were trying to find something that both balanced a regular uh, rhythm to the facade that could be kind of in keeping with the spirit of the design guidelines, but also recognize that we have a more idiosyncratic residential use behind that facade that the commercial buildings didn't have to wrestle with. So that's just an observation, but it's what kind of went into that. It wasn't even so much, um, you know, that, that that rhythm was something we, we started with at the outset. Right. It actually wasn't. It was more about, let's look at the apartment mix, the layout of, you know, bedrooms and living rooms, and how can we regularize that and make it as rational and simple as possible, um, which we hoped we had arrived at. Um, and then the only other flip to that is, um, our, I mean, as an architect, except from the development team, as an architect, nothing's more important to me to make sure that I'm presenting a building that we are all enthusiastic about and happy about and feels like it contributes to the, to the district. I also recognize that a brick building like this today, it's very expensive to build. So I'm wrestling with um, trying to bring something to the table that we all feel like relates to downtown very well, um, at the same time be responsible to my client and actually get a building that can be built with a real budget supported by market rents. And that's a really tippy scale that we're on. Um, even since we last saw you, we received more pricing from two contractors. 
we are right at the ceiling of making this viable versus not viable. So could we introduce stone sills and lintels and things like that? Sure, I can draw it. I'm not sure it could get built and supported by market rents. So I'm trying to find that balance between bold, good architecture um, at the same time having a project that we know is still viable at the end of the day. So, and to just go back to some of the key things that I do think will be a distinguisher um, in, a, in a big way, even compared to some other similar developments in other towns is just trying to introduce depth and scale in a way that gives the building um, a good cast shadow and reading to all these window openings. Just, just putting the window eight inches back costs money. That's something we've proposed to do, and many, many developments wouldn't come out and start with that as a premise, and sometimes you can end up with kind of very flat facades that feel thin, almost like you know paper, wallpaper facades. Um, whereas this is introducing a significant amount of depth, which I think just the material in general will read really strongly, um, like a lot of the buildings in the downtown area. Um, so again, I, I understand your comments, but um, we're also trying to make sure that we're proposing something that we can do for you, and also something that we think is still appropriate in the district. I think there, again, there are many examples of many different patterns. It's not a monolithic architecture downtown. There's many different patterns. And we are a newer, slightly more contemporary building. We can both relate to history and be a building of our time, be slightly different of today. I don't think those two things are mutually, mutually exclusive. I think we can still be contemporary and forward-looking and um, clearly honoring the history um, of the town. I think those can often be a really happy marriage, actually. Um, and make this a building, we think, at the outset, we really tried to draw a building that specifically was for North Northampton, not for another town. We, we thought um, through the kind of arrangement of that facade, we tried to respond really directly to those design guidelines and make this a building that's for here, not for somewhere else. What windows are you going to specify? So these would be um, passive house windows, which means that they would be triple glazed, um, and it's a casement window with the with the upper portion being fixed. Um, do you know the manufacturers? Not yet. I'll have to bid that out and really do it in a kind of competitive bid environment to make sure that we can really get um, you know the best value for the for the project again to kind of control construction costs. Um, this the dimensions tend to be very similar. You know, like you're not going to see with double or anything like that. You know, they're, the products are fairly similar and competitive to one another, but the key for us would be a passive house or a side window that's triple glazed. Can I just know also, for example, um, you know, public maybe who weren't here last time and also for um, uh, other folks, you all talked last time about the design guidelines and this building relative to the main street where the historic buildings are, which is that core main street block. And this this leading into downtown is a very different um, character, has even more um, um, mix, and you have one story, you have 1950s and 60s and other examples, and even the Hotel Northampton isn't, um, you know, it's built as a hotel, obviously, not a famed commercial building. So there is a whole mix there, and the design guidelines really talk about looking at the setting within the block. Um, and obviously, there are some buildings that um, are not historic, right across the street or right next door, so it's not an easy thing to pull from those and try to attach it to a new five-story building. But the, the, so the guidelines aren't um, meant to replicate the historic buildings in, on Main Street, but really pull from that and talk about window rhythm and um, groupings of windows and differentiating, um, you know, horizontal and vertical planes in a new building. So, um, as opposed to saying you need to look like a building in this.
Um, I think there, when the committee is looking at um, whether or not to approve the project, they're going to be looking at the design guidelines that talk about patterns and rhythm of um, design and layout and not so much um, whether um, there's a precise And I'm making my point, though, is that this building is such a big, important project that it has the potential to bring that really interesting design of the rest of downtown up towards King Street and expand the commercial district in a good way. And um, so I'm, you know, I, I want the project to live up to that potential to as it can. <coughs> Um, I'm curious of the choice of a casement because I hadn't even occurred to me, but the lower units being the casement portion of that, um, when when they start being used, your building's going to be read visually very differently, seeing windows swung out all over the place. I mean, traditionally, I mean, it's almost exclusively double homes, which keep your facade flat. That the sides can look very broken up with, and I was wondering if there's some restriction on how far the casements would be opened. Yeah, typically the casements have a four-inch limiting stop, just for so they can't open beyond four inches. Oh, really? So, so it's like a safety thing for kids and whatnot. Um, and then it's also a bit of an ADA concern because um, you know windows are supposed to be able to be reached from a certain height, and double hung with their locks at the mid sash and and even how you kind of reach and, and operate the window um, can be very problematic from an ADA compliance point of view, which is why um, casements tend to be a better solution. And they, and they the other key thing about that, um, if I didn't say it, Jeff would correct me. <laughs> um, uh, the casements, because they have a cranking hardware, can actually have a pressure seal that really makes them airtight. You can get a passive house window with a casement operation I'm not even sure they make a passive house window in double hung just because the nature of the, the moving sash is just not very airtight. It's not, it doesn't have good performance values as compared to a, a casement. A little bit, a little bit of both. All right, I'm going to chime in, but I seem to make everything echo in here. Um, <laughs> so just to reiterate some of the comments that. Um, that Joe is making is that I I agree I think I think the improvements that you made are improvements I don't know where to go to get away from that. Um, I appreciate that you brought the building down. I like the darker cornice. I like that the sort of the penthouse effect on top is. Is pushed back and not as prominent, um, but I agree with Joe in terms of the rhythm of the windows, um, and I understand what you're saying. This is a fully residential building except for the first floor, but that's what architects do, right? We figure it out, and I think it is possible to figure out another rhythm um, that right now your rhythm is sort of it's got one beat, basically, across the front. And most of the buildings in downtown have uh, at least two beats going on. You know, there's something else interesting. I also think we, you talked about lintels and fills. And uh, the lintel or the top of the window, it's really a band. It's not, and it's consistent all the way across. It doesn't define the window openings um, and the sills. I appreciate that you have the darker brick, but I think there's actually not enough of a contrast, or at least we're not seeing enough of a contrast. The bays, it's very monolithic, um, like Bob was saying, and I think that's we want. I think there's there's still the potential there to make it a little more lively and a little more interesting than it is right now, because it does have that. Uh, either industrial or office park uh, building look to it. It reminds me of something from the 1970s or 80s 
especially with the way the brick is being used with the you know the very very tall soldier courses it's it's not the way you would traditionally build with brick um, yeah I was even part of that inspiration came from this building looking at what almost feels like a continuous soldier course expressed over those window window lintels I mean they're individually um, created because that's a you know a, a traditionally built brick wall um, but um, seeing soldier courses like like that or um, but that's a that's a single soldier course it's not like it's four, like a, four or five tall soldier course correct more than a brick very long Roman brick but yeah but um, it's not it's, it's not five course. courses of brick sure and then um, so seeing details like that and and just looking at how sometimes like spandrels like this facade is really more than a punched opening facade it's kind of a frame facade right you read the piers and then you read the spandrels as kind of beams connecting from pier to pier um, so, and that was kind of a decorative brick moment, turning the bricks and creating that panel. So it was looking at, or spandrels like this, um, it was looking at some of those moments and trying to uh, combine some of those ideas into and something that's evocative of that, not literally that. Um, doing it in a kind of constructible kind of way. And I, and I think, like Carolyn said, we're not looking for you to replicate what's downtown. I think what we're saying is what you're proposing doesn't have a strong enough relationship to downtown. That it doesn't feel like it, it's a Northampton building. Um, there are other buildings that just down the street on Pleasant Street that were very successfully done. Um, the contemporary way that have a relationship to the patterns and the rhythms of, of uh, buildings in downtown Northampton. 65, live. <laughs> sure, yeah, we looked, we looked at that one, the yellow brick. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there, it's, it's a window with one piece of glass over another, very similar to ours. The window groupings are different. One thing I'd say about that building with the brick detailing, it's very flat. The windows are an inch and a half back. It doesn't matter. Sure, I'm just saying what we can offer, which is versus across the street from that, there are buildings that have four inch deep pilasters and another eight inches of, of depth from there for the windows. And in my mind, the building across the street from that is more successful than this one in that one particular area. I don't like that building. I think it's very successful in many ways. Um, and I guess another thing, I know brick is is incredibly expensive and it, and it is um, surprising that you're proposing to do the entire building in brick, which isn't a requirement. You could do the head building in brick and the back could be something else that's allowable mm -hmm. and an, often a way to value engineer the project. Right. You make what's really special out front, and in the back is a little less special. Right. Yeah, as soon as as soon as this group is is done. Um, and the only other thing I'll say about the window grouping, just in complete full transparency, why we're showing you what we're showing you. Um, we came away from the last meeting because there was a specific conversation about that rhythm. We came away from that last meeting with the understanding that that basic rhythm was okay and it was the window reading itself. Um, that was what the conversation centered around. So we didn't want to start changing things that you were already comfortable with. We wanted to focus on the things that you had commented on. So um, we walked away thinking pretty clearly that, okay, this rhythm is fine, but let's study the, the, the actual reading of the window itself, which is why we changed the color and the panel below um, to address if, that. If I gave you that impression, you misunderstood me, I sh I'm sure, because you know, the, the, the rhythm of the windows was definitely one of the things that, that I was concerned about at the first year. I thank you. I think this is a wonderful conversation to be having. 
for us to figure out a way to, to make it work for everybody. I don't know that we know how to figure out how to build a residential building with uh, bedrooms with one window, nominally three, three and a half feet wide, and living rooms with two windows, and not do it this way. Uh, this is a not an affordable housing project. This is a project that's going to achieve higher rents than anything else else in Nor Northampton. It needs to in order to be able to support its cost. It has to have windows big enough and appropriately placed in order to be able to provide the necessary light to the interiors. And this is a very thoughtful solution to that. And really, if you can think of another way for us to accomplish the interior layouts in a successful way to pay the rents that are going to be paid by altering the window pattern, we'd be glad to listen to you. I'll just chime in there. I'm, I'm sure that your architects can figure it out. I, I doubt it, having built many, many buildings, uh, market rate buildings, and I've accomplished a lot for you here. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> we don't want to have 600 or 800 windows that are two feet wide just to be able to group three together. It makes no sense. thinking of is, you know, we're not going to have the luxury to look at a building from this position hardly ever. We're going to mainly be driving by in our cars and looking up. And the last discussion we had, um, we were focusing on the human scale, which was at the sidewalk. And so that was addressed. So um, I think the value engineering ideas are fantastic also. You know, maybe changing the material up, having some sort of juxtaposition, juxtaposition between the brick and metal of some sort, or you know, in the back. But um, I think it, I think it addresses the uh, human scale concern. As, as, um, I, it, it seems to me that it would be possible to play with the dimensions and the location of the windows, even just a little bit, that would make the rhythm work better. It's also, the building is, when you look at it straight on, it's very kind of monolithic. If it were, if it were, if it had some kind of design in the brick that um, um, put it into three sections, so it, it, that might make it look more interesting and less monolithic. It's, um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that any of these suggestions drive up the cost of the building that, that much, particularly if, if you took some of the brick off of the, the side that, and uh, the air portion of the building and went to a different. I guess um, what we were looking at was these um, two foot piers that are four inches deep, 20 feet on center to introduce, to break up that monolithic nature of the facade and, and you know, it, perhaps in these renderings and, and images you won't fully appreciate that, you can probably see it best here, but that notion was to address that exact concern which you don't, you don't want this to read like one horizontal, you know, start to finish plane, but you want to break it up into this 20 foot rhythm um, to almost have it feel like a series of buildings next to each other. and. That's why we were introducing those piers, which again felt um, very much in keeping with right. how the piers are done here um, on these buildings. Again, to take a facade and to break it into into smaller bays. So, in terms of what appropriateness, we thought that fit squarely into the it kind of intent. The way it looks, it's too subtle. The way you did it. Yeah, I mean, again, the, the exact same dimensions. You know, two feet wide, four inches deep. It's something you see on countless buildings downtown that those two dimensions are used. I, I think the piers are fine. It's, it's the, it, you have the two and then the brick panel and then the one. And so that brick panel in the middle in the bay, is that part of the 
Is that part of the 20-foot bay? 20-foot bay, yeah, is the two and the one. Here's the pier. Yeah. And here's the pier. And right. That's and 20 feet on that. Okay. And what is that? You have three windows there. You have right. two, right. and then masonry, right. and then one. Right. And what is that wide masonry between the two and the one? I think it's four feet. The window is three foot four. But that, are you that? saying that's part of the structure that can't be altered? That's part of the accommodation we're getting. Here's the two, here's the one, there's that brick. Here's the two, here's the one, there's that brick. And here's the two, here's the one, there's that brick. You can see how the walls are, are coming into that. And it was this rhythm. I swear to you, I did many, many, many iterations of this, different unit mixes, putting a studio. There was a three bedroom down here for a while. It was actually very difficult to get these rhythms to sync up with something regular on the facade, and this was the kind of kind of most rational way we could resolve it, and in a way that I thought was again just really met the spirit of what you were looking for, which was breaking down facades using masonry piers into something that's repetitive as a grouping. Um, it, the fact that it's two and one that, you know, slightly different than patterns seen downtown, perhaps, but there's also many versions of patterns downtown that I think it could take another pattern. It would be the 12th pattern, not the second pattern. You know, I think there are, there are many patterns. I don't think just because we can't find this exact pattern that it's then therefore invalid. I think it's just another solution, another pattern, but still, Appropriate and still in keeping with the kind of general DNA of what the, the basic, you know, breaking up and, and modularity of, of the of the facade. Um, are there any further comments from the board? it up to the public. Sorry. I'd like to open it up to the public. Comments. If you come up, could you please uh, state your name? Thank you. My name is Jana Ugoni. Uh, I'm a lighting designer and manufacturer, and my husband and I own several commercial properties downtown and we're involved in design. My husband is one of his his main building is right next door and our daughter uh, and her partner have an apartment next door to this proposed site as well. I don't have anything you can turn yours off for a minute. I don't have anything planned to say, but I want to express that I thank you for doing the modifications, and I see the lineup of the windows that you made and the addition of the cornice and the warmer colors. I think, I think the basic difference here is that mathematically and from a construction standpoint, this project does make sense to your firm and how you interpret the pattern in Northampton. I think those of us who live in Northampton, many of us are creative, and we have an identity as being a creative town, we look for the verve in a building, creativity, the spark. So sometimes another building, like the Live 155, may not have as expensive materials or they may not even have the rhythm. But somehow, they brought the articulate design to a town that desires that and has been known for that. That's our identity. So we want this piece to be a piece. We want it to be an articulate, beautiful contribution to this town that we're proud of, that extends the specialness of downtown into King Street. 
We're not asking you to do something that isn't practical or is way too expensive or makes you frustrated to go back to the drawing board again. We're just asking that you see that there's some arc of design or uniqueness that will continue our spirit of a town and our city in Northampton. A lot of the buildings that you are referring to downtown, even though they may have seemed to you like a relief or a pattern that you felt you captured, they also had a whole row of arched windows at the top that gave it its character or a color like on Life 155, that intense, beautiful blue at the top with yellow brick and the change of materials, as you pointed out, in the back where things can even be less expensive. But they, they actually add creativity to the project as well. So I think we're really looking for some aesthetic spirit. Now, one thing that Live 50, 155 brings is also brings artwork to the forefront. I mean, there's the, 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 the naming of the building, the artwork on the side, sorry, um, all bring a liveliness and creativity to Northampton that everyone loves this building and people who live there feel like they're creative. I feel like th this, and, and, they, and, and it makes them feel, I think you must be picking up something from your system. Um, it makes them feel like they're part of something bigger or something that they, doesn't come natural to them, but they love it here. The, the people flock here for retirement because there's so many creative options. We're a five college area. That in and of itself has a verb and vitality that we need to live up to. I mean, we need to, if we're going to extend King Street, let's set a precedent here. Every building has a chance to have a personality to bring forth some unique spirit. And I love that you brought the wood around to the front, and most, mostly because the whole timber inside is so beautiful. No one would know that looking outside. It almost looks like a hospital some place where there are units, and I don't mean that to be insulting. There are some gorgeous hospitals. I'm just saying that it doesn't scream or it doesn't read warm, inviting residential. And I, 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 I've, done some, I've done a few renderings. I was the person that brought forth that first illustration last time quickly just because I thought it might be um, of interest to bring in some sort of pull that up. Actually, you have a, a printout of it, and then I have another one that I did today because I got inspired and um, so were you here last time? I don't think so. So last time I proposed this because I saw uh, in our neighboring neighborhood meeting, like I got to see the inside of one of them, and I thought by bringing some wood on the outside and color, tint the windows, bring wood up top, that somehow the, the inside of the building and the outside were more connected. Sure, which directly influences what we're showing here today, which is why we introduced more wood at the, mm. at the base of the building. Um, we, yeah. we couldn't push it back like you were showing, just because of kind of the retail configuration. And actually, this wood can't be used more than 40 feet above grade. It um, doesn't meet building code. So um, otherwise, we may have- So you be, couldn't be up top. So you can't quite go up top, because I would, mm -hmm. I, honestly, I would have looked at that as well. Mm -hmm. But I think what's good about a public process like this is we all contribute ideas. Our job is to try to synthesize those, all those ideas also fair to say that not one person in the room will get everything they want, but hopefully we all get something we want. Um, 
-hmm. And so we were trying to balance <coughs> all of the influences um, and propose something that was addressing everyone's comments. Well, honestly, a lot of what you're showing in that rendering is what we were trying to incorporate with the dark brown tones, mm -hmm. um, the wood on the storefront like you're showing, and just to kind of, to kind of warm it up and move away from the silver tones. May I add, please, um, we are creative people as well, sure. and we, it's not abundantly clear, we take very seriously the importance of the character of this town, and it is very difficult to square subjective aesthetic decisions person to person. But please know, we take it with the utmost seriousness in every step of the process. Sure. We do not take casually the importance and beauty of this town. This is our first project of this type, and we have chosen this town specifically because it is such a beautiful town. And we, we have not made any decisions casually or without adhering to that as our guiding light. So please know, because that is very much how we operate. I respect that, and that shows, and I think that because it's not our first project in town here, we're, we're, we're so attached to the momentum that's been created already with these particular buildings in town that have already set a precedent. They have so much character and verve that we love it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that what you have done needs to be scrapped by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's been obviously considered and considered many times over and over again. And you can see the depth of the conversations that got you to this point and how much you took into consideration from the last meeting to here. I'm just here to add one more piece to say or to reiterate perhaps what some of the board started to say and resonates with me um, is that we would love it to be creative. Maybe we're different than some other New England towns in that I know we're quintessential in because we have a lot of New England character, but we also have this other piece. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me. I would just reiterate again that we take it as seriously as you do, and it's very difficult to square aesthetic person person. Of course. I'm, I'm only here to offer mine, too. Here's the, this is the building as it is, with just some color. What do you know? Let me make sure it's bright enough. Um, yeah. This is, I'll talk to the board first. This is the building as is, with just red awning, colored windows, and a teal top that echoes it. I did warm the brick up, but I, I see that it is that color, so that was the only other alteration that I did. Just to add a little bit of creativity and the color. Can you bring that a little closer? I don't need to insult you in any way, shape, or form, and I really hope that that's not what this is about. I, I, I'm feeling something from you, and I'm so no, sorry. I, I don't need to take it insult. as seriously as you do. Of course really you do. I've spent my whole life in the world of design, and I recognize that. I'm only just presenting something that I hope maybe also feels pleasing or more exciting or a little more Northampton without changing the nature of what you've done or taking seriously what you have done. Slightly. I kept everything else the same. You kept well, the wood on the bottom. Yes, your wood, your wood is not on here, which will make it even better. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, pause this and offer that you could continue this discussion, but I want to give other members of the public the opportunity to sure. talk. For your all one family. So you know, all right. And I'm, I'm going to be a little less diplomatic than my beautiful, wonderful wife. Uh, I'm not questioning your commitment. I'm questioning your success. 
I know you guys are trying hard and you're trying to do something great. You just haven't gotten there yet. This is not an attractive downtown Northampton building. It's extremely institutional. So I've heard industrial, but institutional. Is that this is like a college dormitory. It does not fit into downtown Northampton. And even though it's not on Main Street, it is in many ways more important because it's the gateway from the north to get to Main Street. And you guys have a lot of work to do, I think. To, and windows make a building, and these, this window pattern just isn't working. I appreciate the, I'm a businessman, I appreciate the economics involved, but that's not an excuse to, to build a, a building that isn't great. I appreciate the passive part of it. I have seven solar arrays. Jan and I are off the grid. Almost every one of our buildings has an array on it, so we're very committed to that. But, you know, this just doesn't cut in it yet. So I'm sorry. I, it's not a message that is easy to deliver. I'm sure it's not easy to hear. Any other comments from the public? It's more around um, the functionality. You, you had said that the courtyard in the back. Go back up. Um, in the very beginning, when you talked about the courtyard in the back, does that take into consideration the bike storage? Yeah. Did you see that? Shelter. And how many bikes do you think that will actually store? This particular model holds 32. 30. How many units are in the whole building? We'll have other bike storage in the garage in the area. Yeah. Okay. We just haven't played that out yet. Mm -hmm. Do you have one parking space per unit? Yes. Floor. Did you mention that the first floor timbers would be, I'm mean, sorry, the first floor supports would be concrete? Yes, it has to be for building code, for fire, fire mm -hmm. separation. So at the street level, you won't see that, what you see upstairs. I, I think so. This being a five story under 85 foot height may be able to be all timber yeah. down to the ground. Uh, however, I uh, Typically, parking garages are built with concrete on the first floor. There are some timber ones, and hands are not really ideal for timber framing, so concrete works a little better. I mean, I would be hopeful that maybe the front of the building, the retail, could have timber all the way down to the ground so that, you know, that retail space becomes very special. That's all I was going to say, the same exact thing. I think that would be beautiful. Yeah. All right. But we're going to try to make that work. Any further public comment? Can we go back to the side of the other building? Come up and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Gina. Okay, I'm Gina. I'm also a designer. I live in town. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about these buildings, and obviously I'm not an architect. Um, um, so you went very technical in these sort of renderings about um, dimensions and the sizes, and um, I, I certainly won't even share part of it. But I wanted to talk about the artistic part of it, which is the arches on the top. Just this little foot part of brick um, up at the top of the window, and so you have it on the bottom, um, like this one. But this also is reflected up on the top too, and that sort of mimics um, of a art element. Same with this building, which is on the top, and then the top of our brick um, going vertically rather than horizontally, and then the bottom as well. And then this part is so beautiful because it has the bump out. Um, and then this very interesting top as well, which is repeated in this pattern. And you can see the bump outs here and the bump outs there, um, as well as all of the arches are repeated. Um, here the arches are repeated, and this over here is just the top square part with the bottom. Um, and so these 
these are the little details that we love in Northampton. Maybe seeing if we can add some of those elements. Any further public comment? I have a question on the corner. You say it's only 15 inches? Well, that seems pretty thin considering it's going to be 40 feet in the air. Now, like the Sweeties building, the one on the upper right. Um, and uh, say the, the building on the upper, uh, uh, it's also on the uh, upper left. Isn't that, that, that looks so much more uh, pronounced than just uh, 15 inches. I don't disagree. I also think there's an extreme variety in town from something that probably only projects eight inches in, in, at this kind of detail level or, or you were pointing out, you know, masonry parapets with kind of a minimal stone cornice, that's definitely less than 15. I think there's a range. I think what makes it successful when it projects is that you get the shadow line. I think that's what really um, makes it read. Um, and so um, that undersized surface um, being kind of a clean 15 inches gives you that nice deep shadow line. And that's really what, the, what you feel on a cornice, I think, as you're walking, is that, um, that, that change in tone, the cast shadow, is the effect you're trying to get. I think what's very deceiving is the fact that if you show the Cornish section, uh -huh. yeah, somewhere. Um, the upper projection, the, uh, I don't know the word, the inset in the cornice is, the back is actually set back from the surface of the building. Yes, uh, a little bit. Yeah, right. it's so that the upper projection really doesn't extend out as far as you know, the 15 inches isn't off the building. It's, it's, it's divided between the inset and the top of the cornice. Right, but as you're looking at the building, you're never directly underneath it looking straight up. You're often a yeah. few feet away, so you do see all 15 inches. I think part of it is it's very It also thin. just makes it a little... Yeah. Um, easier to construct, quite frankly. Hanging things far off the building can get expensive with steel right. reinforcement and everything else. I was, I was repairing many brick cornices downtown that are yeah. almost falling off. Right, so. yeah, but, which, which um, makes me nervous. Um, yeah. So this is kind of a, um, a technique to give you the, the cast shadow, but also um, get it into the kind of construction of the wall. When you're looking at the building also from the front, the left side of the building, the north side, the cornice just does it return there? I, I'm not reading around. it too well. Correct. You know? yeah. Uh, no, yeah, it's totally fair question. Um, the same relationship holds as it turns the corner. Right? Exactly. Everything, everything just turns yeah. and goes around and then returns to the inside corner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As well as on, on this side. Another detail just to clarify, um, again, sort of the guidelines aren't about creating certain impressions of art or art, art elements that are in uh, the historic buildings, but they're very specific and technical um, to some degree, and so they talk, guidelines really talk about um, windows and cornices and not that they need to have um, same dimensions, but it really is about creating, um, making sure you're creating those division lines and you have a presence of cornice, but it's not necessarily the depth and dimensions of the historic buildings. Um, um, you all also may, some of you were not on the committee at the time that 155 um, Live was uh, approved. Um, but you remember there was a lot of discussion about the flatness of the building and concern about that corner and the applicant, even though art is not part of your purview, <laughs> the applicant promised that they would fill that big blank wall with something. And so that was an after the fact. They, they knew they had to take care of that big flat facade. And so that's why we have that there in the corner. Any further public comment? I'm going to close um, public comment and bring it back to the board. Um, any further discussion? 
Uh, go ahead. I, um, another, so you you have a vertical division between um, like every um, between each group of three. But if the if you had the two that were kind of in the middle, dividing it dividing in groups of six and made them less subtle, but just made them stand out a little bit more, because that might provide, that would, might be a way of, of providing a little more interest. You know, if the, if the two windows that are so close together were a little bit farther apart, that might make the rhythm work better. I, you know, I'm not an architect, I don't know, but I, I just, um, um, Trying to figure out what it is I don't like about this, what would make me like it better. And I know you don't want to hear this, but you know, my preference would be to continue the hearing and to have you work on the rhythm of the windows and the the um, path of the building in some to, to break it up in some interesting way that would make us feel better about it. And um, I don't. I don't feel like this, you know, it's going to be a, something of a delay in in getting your approval, but I don't feel like it necessarily has to add a lot of, of cost to building. Um, I know it's not what you want to hear, but what I'd like to see come out of this. Continue it into how you tweak the, the rhythm of the windows and the and break up the, the horizontal mass. Yes. I have a question. Are you focusing only on levels two? Is everybody here just focusing only on levels two, three, four on the front part of the building? Um, no. Yeah, I would say okay, so. What else do you focus on? Up. And if you're coming down King Street, that is what you're going to see to dominate your. And well, that's correct. That's how we get the bulk. That's how we get the bulk. Back to what Peter said earlier. That's not up to snuff. So I'm going to. I'm, I'm sorry. Some windows and make them a massive different sheeted. Her off time. I think you guys can do better. I'm sorry. I got it. We're we've closed public comment. I'm sorry. I do, I do feel that you know I. I like the changes that you made to the fifth floor of the building. I mean, it, it's not anything I would have ever thought of, but I, I do think it, it, it's gonna, that's going to work okay. And I, you know, that, um, but it's, it's, it reminds me too much of these those massive buildings and apartment buildings in downtown Amherst that that I don't that nobody likes the look of, and uh, and it, I just. I want it to be more interesting and make pedestrians look up at it and say, yeah, that's, I like being here. That's, that's cool. I think part of the issue in terms of analyzing this is, I mean, we're still looking at renderings. We're not looking at the real building. So the, the angular perspective drawings make those windows read a lot differently than you do when you look at the front, which is very flat and graphic. I just want to get up and point out something here. Um, I think what bothers me personally is that when you have the pairs of windows, these piers still tend to make all the build windows look like single windows, so it becomes more monotonous. I don't think there are any partition walls behind these inner piers. There aren't. My suggestion would be if these, if that was or if these were truly doubles or mold or mold in a less wide fashion, I think you would start to see the pattern differently. But sure. In that straight on perspective, I just see a bunch of single windows. And I'm, like I mentioned earlier, in a perspective drawing, these recessed parts do read no more of a pattern. Yeah. 
personal. Design is personal, you know? I think in this particular view, what we're seeing is it is that horizontal banding is so is really prominent, and you almost lose the bays. And I don't know if that's because there's not enough shadow to show us those pilasters sticking forward. Yeah, that's a little bit better there. Yeah. In the way that it renders, you kind of read it better. I think part of it might be because the colors are so similar. Yeah, and I, I think what's happening is that the the wide piece of masonry between the two and the one is is dominating those pilasters where you want the pilaster to be the thing that projects and is most prominent, and and I, I, maybe that's what is making us have a hard time with the window spacing. Kind of just hear what else might be on the table before I make that proposal. Other comments? Yeah. Here's what I'm wondering: is if um, if we work with you to study this rhythm so that there's a better differentiation to the 20-foot bays, that you read the 20-foot bay more clearly and it doesn't kind of blend blend in too much, because I hear what you're saying about that. We work with you on that with the assumption that brick detailing and the tones and everything else about this facade is acceptable. Is there a condition that you can write today that says you need to show us options within these 20 foot bays to get this rhythm to be stronger? That's something we can come back with. But you know, it would be in the context that we've arrived at something other than that rhythm is deemed appropriate. As far as I'm concerned, everything else you presented to a site is completely acceptable. The only thing I'm hearing is this window pattern. Well, that's why yeah. I raise it. I mean, again, I think... I agree with you. Again, as part of the public process, I think we're all getting something. We might not all get everything, but I think we're all getting something. But this te this seems to be when we boil it down, probably the most central issue amongst everyone. That's why I'm proposing if, if there's a way to get approval with conditions where we come back to you with alternates for this for these three windows every 20 feet, speaking the dimension, be looking at that unit rhythm with the assumption that the other details in the wood the storefront and the, the floor and everything else about it I would feel better continuing the hearing rather than giving. And usually, when we put conditions on a on an approval, it's much more specific and and very narrow. And I would rather continue the hearing, but um, but certainly with the understanding that we are making progress and that we're understanding each other and and we have a constructive um, direction that. You know, um, uh, is likely to lead to approval because I, I think you're understanding what we're talking about. I think something could be accomplished just with brick color. I mean, I think structurally you're, you're there. You know, it's just I agree with Elon in that terms of those those wider bands that aren't. Piers, what do you call them? The piers? Yeah, pilasters. Piers. Either one. Yeah, but yeah, but I agree that the pilasters don't read because those wider setback piers are, are flatter. You know, yeah. I think you understand what I'm trying yeah. to no, no, I, 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 I think coloration could do a lot for that. And exactly. I would, and I'd repeat that you, know, you have six divisions, but you really want to, you don't mind necessarily want to make it look like six. It would be better if it looked more like three. So you, you um, so it would be, um, I don't, I don't know that we want to get into the actual what yeah, it, what the rhythm it's needs to be. Suggestion. I think might I might like to look at. 
I, I think it's that we're seeing a very wide building, and we know the bays are there, but they're not reading as clearly as they could. So if you want to narrow it down, I mean, if, if you do feel like you could want to continue it versus granting a permit um, except for the final bay configuration, would you be going to continue it? Do you want to uh, vote on accepting all the other elements of the building except for the bay? Um, the applicant is clear on what they need to work on? Um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty big condition. I mean, it's, it's much less, and it's a very subjective condition. So, it, usually, when we make, when we do an approval with a condition, I like, I'm more comfortable if it's a really something objective. But I suppose I could live with that kind of. Uh, I think the thing that. Um Maybe Joe and I, and, and maybe the rest of the board is struggling with is, is this building is going to be really important to downtown, and it's it's going to set a precedent. Um, and we've we've heard from some folks in downtown who live and own property nearby that this isn't meeting the expectations. I think you've made great improvements since the last time we got together. Um, and we really want it to be the best that it can be. And but I also understand from a developer's point of view and a architect's point of view that asking you to go back does cost money. It takes time to to think about it further. Um, and so we're struggling to balance that. We want this project to happen because it's a great project for Northampton. Um, but we want it we want it to to set the precedent for King Street that it should. Also, you could speak to this tomorrow. I'll just introduce the idea. This is an important kind of gateway item for us, milestone item in terms of progressing with a project that's viable, um, which is why I offered this potential conditional approval as an idea because the idea of some kind of conditional approval today allows ownership to take next steps that we can't take otherwise, which just fund the project in, in every way. So there's a lot of people who are just working pretty darn close to pro bono, um, and we can't we can't get to that next step. Sure, until you know that yeah. you can tell your investors, no invest in right? Yeah, and you can't be raised. So, so I'll make I'll make a motion that we give a conditional approval to this project. But, um, the um, only limitation is make a motion we give conditional approval to the project. Um, but we have to see a redesigned um, window and brick treatment on the facade facing. Um, I, I might add the, the head building just yeah, so it wraps yeah, around. Right. Head, okay. Okay. Could I? Approval of the project conditional upon um, submission of revised designs for the window and brick treatment in the head building. I just want to ask, there was some discussion. Um, a couple things. One is you should um, officially vote to close. Second would be there was some discussion about different materials for the tail of the building. So if you want to um, include that into your approval, that it doesn't have to be brick material. However, do you want to see that material? Um, do you want to give guidance on what that so, is? So I'll, I'll amend the motion to say that so, if you so, don't have to close. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. like Carolyn, say the rest. What, Sorry, else? what else? Well, so you just might want to discuss what might be appropriate to, to show that there is flexibility if you think that's appropriate. I mean, I heard that discussion. It might help with the, you know, the overall cost. Um, so, um, are we ready to make a motion on this? I'll go close the meeting. Any further comments? Can I get a motion to close the meeting? All in favor? 
I'll make a motion to give a conditional approval to the project, um, conditioned upon receiving um, revised designs for the treatment of window and brick on the head building, and um, if the applicant wishes to change the um, material on the rear portion of the building, that's um, something that we would consider. I'll second. Okay. Thank you for going through the process. It appears that the comments were clear today. I understand exactly the observation on the rhythm. I look forward to bringing back the revised. Thank project. you very much. I know this is, we're giving you a hard time, but it's a really important project and we really generally like it and this is really what we want to see happen on King Street and we really want to get it right so that people continue to come to this town and look around and say, wow, this is really and we hear you loud and clear, and hear you all loud and clear too. Uh, and really know that you want to make this building have the verve, have the life, have the uh, character that Northampton to be and believe this building to be. And frankly, as one of the members of the development team, I see a little bit of that opportunity as well, and we'll ask ourselves to see how we can incorporate that into this new window rhythm and design you know, to make progress in that front. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should mention before we adjourn, we, you know, our next hearing will be in November. And that hearing is going to be a continuation of the hearing about St. John Cantius Church. It's likely to be long and um, difficult. And um, um, so I don't know if you're going to have this ready in, in November, but if you do, um, I don't know if you can talk Carolyn into putting it on first. But, uh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but, uh, or, or you might want to wait until December. But, um, well, could we start an alternative meeting? I mean, does it have to be once a month? Can't we no, just pick it all week? We can, yeah, I will um, um, correspond with um, the development team and see what. Is it possible for. Um, before we have the continuation of the hearing, is it possible that if we see um, some interim designs, we could okay. give a comment before the hearing just informally to give you no. an idea? No? No. 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 That's to be part of the public. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I was just trying to <laughs> make things easier. Expeditious. You guys have a two set of minutes. Okay. So thank you all. We're going to continue business. You're welcome to stay. Continue your design discussions in the hall. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I know. I'm very interested in the cloud so that anybody can just see it. It's just part of the file. It can be like, but we can't comment. We can't talk about it. Yeah, we can't talk about it. So we have to do two two more things here. Yeah. Um, excuse me, hi, we're still having a meeting here. If you could continue your conversations in the hall. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, we have two sets of meeting minutes, one from August 3rd, and so I guess we'll start with August 3rd, which was a continuation of this particular meeting that we just had. and. Um,
Does anyone have any comments? Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion uh, to approve the minutes of second. August 3rd. Was this the one with the two meetings or just it was the, one the meeting? two meetings? Okay. And um, it's from August 3rd. I read them today and um, I was just wondering, can you, did, did your tech guy record the transcript? Because um, you had some questions on what I said and what I think maybe Bob said. And um, I'm just wondering, and I certainly don't remember what I said. <laughs> so I was wondering if the transcript is available. Um, I don't know. I can look, but it, you know, in terms of minutes, minutes don't have to capture every single thing that that's what said. I was It's really the essence of the meeting. Really okay. Go use the men's room. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, okay. that's so. what I was wondering. And then and you're just accepting the, the record of the meeting. Yeah, the meeting happened. These people said these X, Y, and you know. Yeah, generally. Then I approve it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So did some, you're making a motion? Is that what you're? Yeah, yeah I make a motion. Okay. Oh, did you make a motion? I'm, I made a motion oh, to approve the August 3rd minutes. All right, second. Can we do this with three people? Yeah. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye. And then we have meeting minutes from September 7th, which was the um, the mural. And there are, there are keys. Oh, it's right there. Sorry about that. By the uh, uh, keyboard on the table. The circle. I, the circle. See the, um, the keyboard, icon. Yeah. And the September 7th meeting notes. All second. All in favor. Aye. I think that's it, right? I make a motion to close the meeting. Oh, good one. Are you second? I second. Aye. <laughs> <laughs>